Hi guys, it's Jonathan. Welcome back to the series where we ask, what is this weapon? Well, we don't know what this is. So, thanks for watching and uh, we'll see you again next week. Not really. We can do better than that. We can at least try to look at the features of this thing and there might just be a design that we can connect it to historically as well. So when I started at the Royal Armouries many, many years ago, 13 to be precise, this thing was on a shelf. Um, it was the only slot in the whole firearms collection with the label unknown. It literally says unknown and uh, the label says unknown. Uh, it had a, a caliber on there that isn't as it turns out, quite correct. So we'll be correcting that. And on and off, I've been looking at it thinking, there's got to be something we can do with this. Um, Freddie Clifford, a, a firearms researcher uh, and contact of ours, has uh, speculated about a designer, British designer called Woodgate, who came up with a self-loading rifle design in 1910, um, with, which has a similar sort of mechanical aspect to it, but it's quite different to that design, actually. I think I have a... Um, a counter proposal there for, for Freddie. Let's have a look at the gun. So, uh, well, rifle, I should, I should specify. Um, it is a gun, but it is also a rifle. This is, this is it. It's plain, it's unmarked, it doesn't fit on the camera. <laughs> it's not that long, 1.1 um, meters, uh, 44 inches in old money from the tip of the, of the barrel to the back of the butt, although there is no butt plate fitted, as you can see, so that would make it ever so slightly longer. While we're looking at the butt stock, it's extremely roughly carved out of a, not walnut, I think that might be a, I don't know, I don't know what sort of wood that is, answers on a postcard, but you can see all of the, the rasp marks where they've tried to file this into shape. The broad shape is what's known as a Monte Carlo buttstock. That comes from the Monte Carlo Grand Prix of pigeon shooting, uh, which was a big thing at the turn of the previous century. So um, around about 1910, that style of buttstock became popular. And the idea there was it gave you a cheek piece to bring your eye in line with the front sight of the shotgun for quick acquisition of a moving target. Similar buttstocks became very popular on uh, sporting rifles as well. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. <laughs> I say that because the, the assumption with any kind of self-loading design is that it's for military purposes. Well, I don't think so. In fact, I'm pretty sure not. We're coming, we're coming to that. Then we get into the, the receiver, which is, as I say, it's white metal, bare metal, steel. You can see, you might be able to see, uh, milling marks where a milling machine has gone in and taken out these panels on either side to make it a bit lighter. This is a hefty beast. This is a good uh, 11 pounds, um, nearly five kilos without a fore end, without a magazine because yes, it is a magazine rifle. We've got this elongated trigger guard, which is perhaps unusual, except that if you have working parts up here and you want your trigger back here where you can reach it from the wrist of the stock, you might just extend it and bridge the gap with a long trigger guard. I don't think this is significant. It's not like there's a second trigger or a very long travel trigger at all. There isn't. The trigger pivots at this point and doesn't go very far. So stylistically interesting, but um, not, not technically significant. I don't think. This weird socket sprouting off the back of the action, it's not that weird if you look at sporting guns that have uh, this style of buttstock, it, you need a socket to attach it into. So it's going to look that way potentially because um, there isn't room here to create the socket, if that makes sense. And then a very square shape uh, around the magazine well um, and on the upper receiver as well. Then we're into some interesting features without getting into the mechanism just yet. We have a recoil spring and guide rod mounted under the barrel. You can imagine that this would be shrouded by some sort of wooden forend on a finished design. Here it's just open. Why is that there? Well, I'll show you in just a moment, but we'll just finish off with the overview. Round tapered barrel, very chunky at the breech end. And this big old flat rear sight base here. That's what, that's 
def definitively, definitively what that is. It's a base for a rear sight. What type I'm, I'm coming to, so I'm saving up a lot for later, but it'll be worth it, I, I, I hope. A sling loop here, not a sling swivel. And then finally, at the front end, a long sight base for a front sight here as well. And then we have the crown. There isn't too much to see there. The rifling is um, not really deep enough to be that visible. Um, it is rifled. It is seven grooves, left hand twist. So that's the overview. But well, you want to know what's weird about this thing, especially if you've spotted that big, um, or heard me talking just now about that big return spring. Why does it need a return spring? Well, this is why. Ugh. <laughs> and I haven't really got mechanical advantage to do this justice, but hopefully you can see all the muscles, frankly. Um, <laughs> As you either pull back, and this is going to take it full travel, that faint click is the mechanism cocking, um, either pulling back all the way manually to cock the thing for the first shot, or when it's cycling, because it is a self-loading rifle, if you haven't figured that out by now, so you fire a shot and the whole thing recoils backwards, and after a short distance, and you should be able to see just how short, pop, there it goes. We have here two lugs, and inside the receiver, two notches. Those fit together and mean that for that very short bit of initial travel, they're locked together. So it's just like a giant self-loading pistol, or rifle for that matter, but this is essentially a form of toggle action. I'll try and show you, I might show you this on the overhead actually. So, much like a Luger, or you might be thinking by now of a Pedersen rifle, although that's um, not uh, recoil operated. It's like a knee joint or an arm joint. It's easier to show you my, my elbows and my knees. So <laughs> that resist, resists a lot of pushing, uh, poking the, poke the um, elbow joint and it just collapses. It's, it's, a, it's very strong like that, but you can very easily um, cause it to, to operate. Same principle in the Winchester rifle, the, say Winchester 73. The Maxim machine gun has a toggle inside it. The Luger has a very obvious toggle on the outside of it. The Pedersen rifle, a few other uh, more obscure designs all have that system. All about keeping that pressure in the barrel where it needs to be until it doesn't need to be there. And then it opens up, just another way of doing it. Um, the big difference with this one is that it's not an external knee joint, if that makes sense. It's internal. So. The, it, it's, externally, it's like a lever. It's just one big flat bar, and all the toggling is happening inside. Most toggle action designs, in fact, but all the ones I can think of, do the hinge on the outside, so that they break like that on the outside. Uh, which means, practically speaking, that say with the Pedersen rifle, you just have a short bit of steel flipping up in front of your eye eyesight eye line. This thing would be an enormous arm, <laughs> just probably quite distracting. It's happening very quickly, but I think there's enough metal popping up in front of your eyes here to be potentially a bit of a distraction. Um, now, we have had this in bits <laughs> to work out exactly how it works. Um, I am not going to take it apart again for the camera, I'm afraid. It's, uh, it's not something we want to do too often, and I have taken some photos to document that. Um, so, the other technical aspects without going too technical, so that's your return spring. This lever here is um, with a bit of faff. <laughs> if you rotate that forwards, you can in fact slide the uh, upper receiver, the barreled action, off the lower receiver, but it's not that straightforward. This is very much a prototype. And then um, some of the rest you can see from inside. So we'll try to show you, um, and I can always throw up some photos if this is unsatisfactory, but there's a sliding bolt, there's a short sliding bolt running in rails inside the receiver that's doing the important shutting of the breech, extracting of the empty case, the chambering of the next round, all of that. So the little bolt is a lot shorter than the great big um, flapping arm on top, obviously, but effectively um, the bottom this bottom part here, 
This is dropping in behind the bolt when it's in the forward position, controlled by the effectively the end of the toggle system. These two arms here, they're attached to the bolt and pushing it forward. You can see that happen. I do that, hopefully. So as the arms shove the bolt into battery, behind that is dropping this great big solid bit of steel inside of which is the firing pin. The arms are also cocking. If I fire this off and open it again, you might notice these little pegs, there's one on each side, they are behind the arms, which means as the arms are doing their job of moving the bolt back and forth, they are also, can you see that, compressing the firing pin spring. So what's in here isn't actually the firing pin. This is, uh, well, depending on your point of view, it's either the back half of a two-part firing pin, or it could arguably be a linear hammer. I'll let the uh, technically minded amongst you argue about that one. But the firing pin that's in the bolt itself, which is just captive inside and moves back and forth, is getting smacked by this. So when it's all in, uh, locked together, that whatever that whatever you want to call that is flying forward, smacking the back of the actual firing pin and firing the cartridge. The only missing bit we have here is what is this pulling against? Because it's only partly pulling against this spring. It needs more spring force. This is really just to return the um, barrel action forwards. Uh, it doesn't do that much for this great big hunk of steel here. So what is this, the bottom end of this, bearing upon? It's hard to show you. I'll show you a photo of that, but it's actually pulling forwards on a re another return spring, um, what you might call a recuperator spring, inside the buttstock. So in here, and this is to disassemble this, you have to push in on this and turn it to disengage a hook that's a lot like the hook on a Luger toggle system. If you've ever taken a Luger apart or played with World of Guns or something, little hooked thing that attaches the toggle together to the, to the frame, same, same deal here. So bottom end of this great big arm is a little hook Bottom, uh, front end of the spring sprung rod inside the buttstock um, has the pegs and the pegs go into the hook, meaning that when you pull back on this, this is pulling a spring forward, storing up spring tension, so that when you let go of it, between the spring in the buttstock and the spring up here, the whole shebang is getting shoved back forwards again. If that sounds complicated, it's because it is. This thing is, is heavy, clunky, overly complicated, and well, it kind of depends how old the design is as to how impressive it is in terms of forward thinking, because we have, uh, Maxim had a self-loading rifle design in 1890, 91. Uh, we've got uh, the Halle, the Bang, uh, the Mondragon, or around about 1890 to 1910, lots of self-loading rifle designs that are more promising, sorry, whoever you were, <laughs> than this thing. <laughs> so, um, one final piece of the puzzle that I can be definitive about is the cartridge type. And that, that's what brings this together in terms of what this is designed to be, because it's not a military rifle. So if we pull out, first of all, what it actually is. So we did a chamber cast on this sucker, and uh, with a bit of trial and error, I came out with this thing. So this is the uh, 400 slash 375 belted nitro express. A very short-lived cartridge invented by Holland and Holland, the famous sporting gun manufacturers and rifle manufacturers, who also invented cartridge types. So it, as you can see, and threw us off initially, it's a very long, quite parallel-sided case with a long neck. A little bit reminiscent of a Martini Henry case, in a way. Uh, so the bullet is 270 grains. So you've got a bullet next to the case here. Quite, so quite, quite heavy for a rifle bullet of the time, uh, or any time actually, more so even today. Um, propelled at, uh, I believe it was only something like 2,100 feet per second. It wasn't going too fast, but it was relatively heavy. This is a medium game cartridge, so I guess some antelope or something like that. I'm not a, not a sporting shooter by any means. And the other aspect that makes this um, somewhat interesting as a type there's a belt around the base of the case. Now that's for something, so, so a wider, it's wider at the bottom, 
wider than the rim, in fact. So though you're using the rim to extract the case, something called head spacing, which you can Google about or ask us about if you'd like, um, in fact, Forgotten Weapons recently did a video about it, is done off the belt here. Why am I mentioning that? Well, it's, uh, it's a feature of the cartridge that's relevant to this, but it's also the first commercially available belted cartridge case. People tend to think it's some sort of reinforcement for powerful cartridges. Well, this kind of proves that wrong because this isn't hugely powerful. The chamber pressures aren't, aren't immense. Um, having said that, it's a 40 caliber bullet pretty well. It's a three, it's a 0.375 of an inch caliber bullet, I should say, which is not small by any means. So this didn't last very long, came in 1905 and was certainly out of favor by as early as 1910, 15, I would say. So that might help us date this thing. And that is in that ballpark of um, designers like Woodgate, but yeah, I, I have a, a bit more information that might, might help on that. Just for, so you can see where this thing kind of lives in terms of British cartridges. The good old 303, which was both a military and a sporting cartridge. Um, ignore the various bullet types, but uh, is there. And there's the Holland and Holland beefier cartridge. Uh, slightly slower, but a heavier bullet. So you've got more mass. Um, the idea there, I guess, is uh, penetrating the skulls of, of um, game animals or at least giving you more surface area. You know, it's all about, um, at the end of the day, it's all about tissue damage, just like warfare. So that actually ties in quite nicely with, to just reprise what I said earlier briefly, a Monte Carlo style buttstock, a, sh a general sort of sporting rifle, shotgun style arrangement, despite the fact we've got a magazine fed self-loading mechanism here, a big old flat sight base. Now this would have been machined for probably four express style flip up sight notches it's very popular on sporting rifles from about 1900 uh maybe a bit earlier to um at least the this one 1950s when scopes became so common that it was more more important to have uh, scope mounts and then you might have a backup single distance rear sight but these so that that's quite diagnostic at least of the barrel um, that style of loop is not military in any way it's it's for a, a, a strap style style sporting sling and the front sight there that style of base is also somewhat diagnostic as well and the way it comes all the way up to the muzzle we suspect or at least it's one possibility something like a steyr so this is from about 1900 uh, and is much more conventional for a sporting rifle. So it has a bolt action in this case, uh, a Mannlicher clip fed action, uh, similar style of buttstock, but without the Monte Carlo cheek piece um, or comb as they called it, but pretty much ignore that. We're here just to show the big flat sight, sight base with the express sights dovetailed into it. Let me just flip one up so you can see what I'm talking about. If you don't, those of you who aren't familiar with this stuff. So that's the 200 yard sight flipped up there's a 100 and a 300. It's to give you a range of difference, um, well, ranges. And then there's that front sight base. And that has quite an unusual um, front sight fitted, but it, something of that size gives you, A, the ability to fit different types of front sight, and, and B, if you, put, if you machine grooves into it, the ability to put a sight protector on it as well. So overall, that's the style of sporting rifle that this is borrowing from. So, given how specific the cartridge is to both time and application, definitely not for hunting, um, why would you choose to develop a rifle around that? Why wouldn't you use 303 or 792 Mauser or 30 6 or something? And then all those other features. Someone was trying to develop a self-loading sporting rifle around that, that category of cartridge. So the early nitro-powered, um, uh, so smokeless, uh, big heavy bullet cartridges, if that makes sense. Not that you couldn't have adapted this to all sorts of other things, if it was any good. Now, so who, who might have been doing this? Oh, well, firstly, just before I get to that, I've kind of underplayed the cartridge. It's still a beefy, beefy old bullet, um, fair bit of recoil, and this system the way this works and the way it's been, it's a first try, let's be honest, probably a first try. 
it has been beating the heck out of <laughs> the rear of the upper receiver. Don't know if it will show, but this has become ramped and distorted. It's been peened effectively by this. I'm not pulling it all the way back, but when, when that comes back under full in full recoil, this is slamming back and bottoming out, and this is slamming back and bottoming out against this bit of steel, and it's not been hardened sufficiently to resist that. So evidence that this, is, along with some, some black carbon deposits in the chamber, although the bore has been quite well looked after, this has in fact been test fired, which is quite nice. It's not just a working model. It was actually tested. So who buy? To, to return to what I was just, <laughs> just trying to say, who buy? Well, we really don't know, but there's one patent that I discovered that is pretty close. And you can check this out for yourself online and see if you think I'm talking nonsense or not. Uh, and that was for a, uh, a chap called uh, Lazar um, Jovanovic. He spelt his name, uh, anglicized, there's an anglicized form that helps uh, people like us sound out <laughs> the, the foreign language there with a Y. And there's the uh, traditional uh, Yugoslavian, Serbian form with a J. The reason I mention that is that he, among other things, designed a pistol that you can see a video on over on Forgotten Weapons in 1931. And his name in the anglicized Y letter form is on the side of, the, of that pistol. He was a, a competitive shooter pistol and rifle. Uh, he developed that, that pistol. Uh, he ended up in Canada in the 50s, emigrated to Canada and invented an Olympic free rifle, they're called, a class classification of, sport, of target rifle called free rifle with a trigger guard based dropping block system. That's in a, an old gun magazine that I, I spotted. So he's definitely developed um, sporting rifles and sporting pistols. And he has this patent for a you know, non-specific, you don't have to do a design a rifle or a pistol for military or sporting purposes. Um, but he has, a, he has a sort of sporting background. What he doesn't have, so he may not be the guy, is any kind of obvious hunting background. So I am being very tentative here. But if you check out that patent, so it first patented in France in 1933, and there's a, a British patent that follows it. It's the identical, it's just a case of lodging it in different countries. That's standard, uh, that's 1934. So after the pistol, so we know it's the same guy that, that did the pistol, that did the rifle patent. But it does depart. If we, um, we'll show you, show you the critical bits on screen because all my chat earlier on about toggles that break, well, the patent, Jovanovich, uh, Jovanovich's patent does do that, which this doesn't. So that's a difference. Could this be a more primitive form of that design? I'm tempted to say, well, it definitely could be. I can't say that it is. And the other difference is that he has a very long receiver with a housing here for that second spring system. Whereas whoever made this has located the spring and rod into the butt stock. So that seems like a more advanced design, bearing in mind that patent's from 1933 and the cartridge is from like 1910, so it doesn't quite work. Whereas the jointed toggle uh, that's more like a Pedersen or something, does feel like that ought to be an improvement on this. So it's not clear by any means what's going on here, but by far the closest design is Lazar um, Ivanovich's rifle patent from 1933. So now it's a case of over to you. Have a look at the patent. Have a look at our video here and, and some pictures. See what you think. If you happen to know more about Ivanovich that would discount him from the running, or if you recognize this particular form of design, please let us know. I'm very conscious that um, my, my linguistic skills are very lacking, and so I'm reading only um, English language sources for the most part. So for those of you in other countries that know about this stuff, if anyone is, is uh, motivated to go off and do some archival research in, uh, in Serbia, um, great. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not asking you to do that, but uh, that, that could yield some results. Then again, it could be a complete red herring. That's the, the fun, but also the frustration of researching historic firearms. I have some exciting news for you. In March, we're going to be running an historic firearms event, which is great in itself. You'll be able to show up for free and see some extra exciting things, as well as the displays of firearms that we have in the galleries. But on the 11th of March, um, I am going to be available 
for a live episode of What Is This Weapon that you can come and see. Um, and we'll also have a bit of a Q&A option later in the day as well. So both of those are ticketed. They're going to be different sort of tiers of tickets that you can purchase. Um, we have the link down in the description, but you can also check out the website or social media. You shouldn't be able to miss it. Um, so that you can come and see me and watch me do my thing and perhaps even come and say hello and have a bit of a chat as well. So very much looking forward to that event um, and to that day in particular. Hope to see you there.